placed his most cherished creation and made in his likeness his treasured possession, his reflection, but man turned himself away, refused his love, fell in. Then his love reached through the night and dawned a brand new day. Then came Jesus, my salvation. Then came Jesus, the Son. Living in fear of dying in darkness, fears wasted in gaining worthless possessions, an obsession lost but wandering on, looking for love in all the wrong places. Then his love reached through the night and touched the heart of man. Then came Jesus, my salvation. Then came Jesus, the Son. grace to me has made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own, but I know I have received. 
Okay, <laughs> that's the problem. Okay, my fault. That, that is a trial that Heman's going through. So an outline, a suggested outline for this psalm is simply this. Lord, please hear me. Lord, please help me. Lord, please hear me. And Lord, please help me. All right, so we're going to uh, take it from the top again and take a look at the first six verses. And here's what we're going to consider. Many of the words and phrases in Psalm 88 um, as a whole that make it uh, clear that this is a valley psalm. And what possible, you'd ask the question now, what possible encouragement can we get from this psalm? So starting again, a song or a psalm for the sons of Korah to the chief musician upon Mahalath. Mahalath is most likely a, a wind instrument. And Leonoth uh, means basically affliction, humiliation, difficulty. Uh, so you get the idea. There's a, it, we, just right from the heading, we understand that this is going to be a, a valley psalm. Mass chill of Heman, the Ezraite. So what, uh, taking the psalm as a whole, what kind of words and phrases do we see um, that give us that indication that this is really a difficult time for Heman? He's in the valley. Full of troubles, nigh unto the grave, down into the pit, no strength among the dead, like the slain, remember us no more, cut off from thy hand, in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thou hast afflicted me, made me an abomination. He talks about mourning and destruction, ready to die, terrors have cut me off. And that's just what we could, we could put up here on the slide. Uh, yeah, this, this is the definition of a trial for sure. Where's the encouragement? <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I need encouragement every day. Amen. Amen? And, and I need to know that I can be encouraged from any portion of God's word. I'll probably sneak into, in fact, we will sneak into Psalm 89 before we're done. But even without doing that right now, where can I get encouragement from Psalm 88? Well, here's some suggestions. First of all, we can be encouraged in God's word because the Bible tells it like it is. Uh, there is no sugarcoating the truth of God's Word. And we don't need to sugarcoat it either. We don't need to soft pedal it. We don't need to, be, need to be obnoxious about it. We need to be loving as we give the truth. God is loving as He gives hard truth. He's loving when He does it. But the Bible tells it like it is. And we need God to... When you go to the doctor and you have a serious ailment, do you want Him just to say, ah, it's no big deal? Or do you want Him to tell you what, what's going on? <laughs> You know, give it to me straight, tell it like it is, and we need that. We need truth that way. The other thing we see that's encouraging in Psalm 88 is that God brings us to the end of ourselves so that we can get out of the way and He can do the greater work in us that He wants to do. We get in the way of that. There's greater things He wants to do in us, His perfect work in us, and we're getting in the way. So He'll bring us to the end of ourselves so that we literally can not just pray it, but mean it, not my will, but thine be done. When we can pray that and mean it, we've come to the end of ourselves. Heman has been brought, I know I say this a lot, but he's been brought to a place where he has no other way to look but up. Now, he's looking down a lot, but he is also, he's realizing, I need to start looking up. He is realizing that. Uh, recognize this, as difficult as it, it is what he's going through, as deep as the valley is, what is he doing? He's praying, and he continues to pray, right? I mean, how does it start out? Oh, Lord God of my salvation, right? Oh, Lord God of my salvation. And let's, let's continue. Let's read the first six verses. Oh, Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thine hand, from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness in the deeps, but he's talking to God about it, right? And here's the thing. Heman is considering his own death, but he's praying to the living God about it. You see that? He hasn't lost his faith. He needs to be encouraged. Yeah. Amen. But he hasn't lost his faith. He's talking 
to the living God. And he's the one we need to talk to as well. The other encouraging truth from Psalm 88 is that uh, we recognize that Heman is convinced. He's absolutely convinced that God is 100% in control of all these things. God is sovereign. God knows what he's doing. Heman doesn't know what God's doing. He doesn't always understand what God's doing and why he's doing it. But God knows what he's doing. Heman at least knows that. He knows that God is sovereign and he's in control of all things. Something else to encourage. When you're reading a portion of scripture like this that's down in the valley, it, it is good and it is okay to, to compare scripture with scripture, as we did Psalm 89.1, and look at the, the counter truth. Look at the encouraging portions of God's word uh, to kind of help us see the other, the other side of this. And so just take a moment Hold your place in Psalm 88 because we won't be gone long. But if you go to Revelation 21, Revelation 21, and this is talking about not a valley, but the eternal mountaintop that we have to look forward to as believers. If you know Christ, this is where you're going to be one day. Yeah. Amen. And let's read a little bit of context just, just to get the, the context. Uh, Revelation 21, 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now here's the verse that we really want to compare with Psalm 88, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen? Let me ask you a question. How does this promise in Revelation 21.4 become more and more and more precious to us the more we go on with the Lord? I'll tell you how, and it's ironic. The more that we experience these things in this life, what things? Tears, death, sorrow, crying, pain. The more that we experience these things, the more that this promise of no more of these things becomes more precious to us, right? And the more we realize that Christ, look at what he's going to do, verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, if you don't have Christ and you don't have this hope, you'll go through something like we read about in Psalm 88, and you have no place to look but down. But Christ would say, don't just look down, look up. And here's the invitation that he would have to you. If you don't have this hope, if you don't know this Savior, here's the invitation, Revelation 21, 6, the middle of it, I will give unto him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely. People without Christ are dying of thirst spiritually. And he is the living water. Yeah. If you don't know him, you can. And when you come to know him, you won't be thirsty anymore spiritually spiritually. You'll be fulfilled, and you'll have these great promises. You might go through, and we'll go back to Psalm 88 now. You might go through, even, and you will as a believer, you'll go through some, many of the things that are mentioned in Psalm 88. You'll still go through them. We live in a, in a, a world that's been cursed by sin, and we're going to have to experience that. But we don't have to do it alone. Yeah. Amen. We can look to Jesus, and he saves us from our sins, from the penalty of our sins, which is hell, and one day from the very presence of our sins, we'll be saved from the very presence of our sins to be in heaven with him. That's what we read about in Revelation 21. But you must be born again. You must come to this Jesus. It's not coming to church. It's not coming to religion. It's not simply praying a prayer. Uh, you don't need church. You need Christ. Amen. Now, if you have Christ, church can help you. The right kind of church that's preaching Christ can help you. But you need Christ. I need Christ. We need Christ. Amen. So these are some encouraging things we can consider about Psalm 88. The last one I'll mention is that the life of the believer is always a win-win. You might think that Heman, I mean, he even ends on a, on a dark note. Darkness is the last word. You might think he's talking about a lose-lose. He's not. How do I know he's not? Because he's a believer. How do I know that? How does it start out? Oh, Lord God of my salvation. Right. Amen. Don't forget how it started. 
Don't forget how it started. Don't forget the work that God started in you when you're in the valley. He hasn't left you when you're in the valley. He's a good shepherd that goes through the valley with you. Yeah. He hasn't left you. Remember footprints in the sand? Lord, why'd you leave me? My hardest times. Oh, no, I didn't leave you during your hardest times. That was when I carried you, God says. Heman is not describing a lose-lose scenario because for the believer, it's always a win-win. Paul says it this way. For me, in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. We win. For me to die is gain. We win. So whether we live or we die, it's unto Christ. Christ is all. And that's how we win, because he's the winner. <laughs> and we have our victory in him. Now, I don't know what you think of when you come across a rose. If you go out here, and, and I don't know if we have any yet, but if, if we do, but if you come across a rose somewhere, it's that time of year, I don't know what you think of. Hopefully you'll think of the beauty that God created and the scent, the aroma that God put into it. And you need to be aware of the thorns. But if the thorns are the only thing you think about, something is wrong. If you see a rose and all you can think about is the thorns, something is wrong. If you are negative all the time, critical all the time, something is wrong. That is not the will of God for us. He would not have us to be that way. You may, you may think that anger is a sin, it's not. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Oh, that means you can be angry and what? Sin not. Jesus was angry in his earthly ministry at times. God is angry at times. There is a such thing as a righteous indignation. The problem is we can get the indignation part down, but the righteous <laughs> escapes us pretty quick. It's not a sin to be... You might, you might be looking at all the thorns in this life because you had a reason to be angry a long time ago, justifiably, but you've allowed that anger to turn into bitterness. And that's sin. It's not a sin to be, you might, it, it's, we can be legitimately angry about certain things and that's not sin at all. What you do with that anger can become sin. If you lash out at others or if you focus on the negative so much that you allow a root of bitterness to develop in you, all you can see is the thorns and no roses. Bitterness is not the will of God for us. And I'm taking a little rabbit trail here because Heman could have easily gotten into this. We could have easily gotten into this. Overly critical, pessimistic mindset. Heman is not, I'm not saying that, that he's there as we read. I'm not saying that about him. I'm saying he's in danger of it because we're all in danger of it. See, we all need to be careful to realize that we have a choice when we come across a rose. We can smell the roses, we can appreciate the beauty, we can give glory to God for it, not being ignorant about the thorns, or we can just focus on the thorns being negative all the time and not be a help to anybody. We have a choice. So that's just extra. <laughs> we need to move on. We left off in verse 6. So let's read verse 7. And let's compare now Heman's suffering, which was intense, and we do not in any way want to minimize what he went through. But we ought to compare it to what Christ went through. Verse 7, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Okay, what did Jesus go through? Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of, his all, of us all. So how much suffering did Heman experience? Here's the answer. Far less than he deserved. How much suffering did Jesus experience all the suffering that all of us deserve. That's right. Amen? We deserve the wrath of God for all eternity, and Jesus took upon himself the wrath of God. Yes. Amen? For all of us. He took upon us the full wrath of God. He paid the price when he died on Calvary for every sin you and I have ever committed. And there are false religious systems in the world today that talk about Christ... But they talk about him in such a way that his sacrifice was not enough. 
You know, Jesus on the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't say it is almost finished. He didn't say, now, I'll do my part, you do your part. But there are false religious systems in the world that try to convince people that, yep, Jesus, Jesus died on the cross. That's significant. He rose again. That's significant. But if you don't do your part, you've got to help save yourself. No, we don't. Jesus is the Savior. If we could save ourselves, he never would have had to come. Jesus is the Savior. He's not the insufficient Savior. He's the all-sufficient Savior. You don't add, and I don't add to perfection, folks. Amen? He gave the perfect sacrifice. And now we as believers do not have to experience that wrath. We can have mercy and grace instead. Jesus took what we deserve, wrath, so that we could have what only He deserves, acceptance before the Father, because we are accepted only in Jesus. Not in our religious works, not in joining a church, not in getting baptized, not in doing a whole bunch of religious things. Jesus is the Savior. He is the only way, but you can come through Him, because whosoever will may come. Let's continue this comparison of Heman's sufferings versus Christ's sufferings as we look at verse 8. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. It's hard when you're going through the valley. It's even harder when you feel like you're going through it alone. Well, did Jesus know something of that suffering? Isaiah 53, 3 and 4, He is despised and rejected of men. Jesus knew the thoughts of the people around Him as they were despising and rejecting Him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And even the disciples, when they took and arrested and took Jesus away to crucify him, even the disciples all forsook him and fled. And those that followed him followed afar off. Jesus understands loneliness, which means... No matter how much we suffer, Jesus has suffered more. And this means that he understands our pain. Yeah. And he understands our pain in a way that nobody else can understand. And he cares. First, John, or First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. It's one thing to have somebody understand. You can talk to somebody, they can offer counsel, and they may have a certain level of understanding, but they may not care. Jesus has both. He understands and he cares. Do you see where we can get encouragement from Psalm 88? <laughs> it's there. Moving on, let's look at verses uh, 9 through 12 next. And what we're going to consider in this passage is um, uh, the importance of acknowledging uh, the reality of death. Acknowledging the reality of death. We need to because it's, it's a reality. So, Verse uh, 9, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Uh, shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? The sobering reality of of death. Now let's make something clear right now. Psalm 88 is not fatalism. It's not pessimism. But it is realism. Yeah. Why? Because death is a reality. I mean, it is. Now, to be focusing on it all the time, that's not normal. <laughs> to focus on death, you know, all day, every day, thinking about that, uh, that's not only unhealthy, that's unbiblical. And I'm not suggesting that's what Heman was doing here, not suggesting that at all. He does talk about it. But, it, but just, if you're just preoccupied with death all the time, that's unhealthy and unbiblical. But I'll tell you this, to completely ignore it, to completely ignore death is also unhealthy and unbiblical as well. All right, so here's, here's the thing. We need to be honest about the reality of life and death. We need to be honest about that. We need to face our own mortality, but here's the good news. We don't need to face it alone. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he makes this promise that though, though people have died, though they were dead, yet shall they live because they've believed in him. He is the resurrection and the life. 
death is not the end. And the believer has the blessed hope of the resurrection, right? The blessed hope of the resurrection. Death is not the end. Now, without Christ, the doorway of death is, is a terrible thing because to die without Christ is to die under God's wrath and judgment. No one has to die that way because Jesus already took the wrath and judgment upon him so that we could have mercy and grace like we talked about earlier. Put your faith in Christ and you'll have those precious promises of Revelation 21 that we looked at earlier. But here's a question. Here's a question about the passage that we just read. You read about the way that Heman describes death, and this question probably comes to mind. Uh, Heman speaks of death without any mention of the resurrection. He doesn't speak of it at all. Did the, and so the question is, did Old Testament saints understand the resurrection? Some people read a passage like this, and they kind of forget about everything else in the Bible. <laughs> and they say, oh, okay, so I guess they didn't know about the, you know, the resurrection. I, it's like, okay, compare Scripture with Scripture because, I, yes, of course they knew about the resurrection, right? Well, Heman doesn't mention it. We'll, we'll address that. But first, let's address the fact that, that the believers in all ages have always known about the resurrection. No believer at any age has thought that this physical life was it. The oldest book recorded, the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. Job lived around the time of Abraham. The book of Job was written. The book of Job was written down before the book of Genesis was written down, right? Genesis goes back to the beginning historically and what's recorded there. But God used Moses to write Genesis. Moses lived after Job. Job lived before Heman. I'll tell you right now, Heman knew about the resurrection. Job did. Job 19, 25 through 27, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, first of all, He is the resurrection, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after I die, though after my skin worms destroy this body, I, I'm, it's not the end of the story. I'm going to be raised. Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job knew about the resurrection. Certainly David knew about the re resurrection. Certainly Heman and all the Old Testament believers, yes, they knew about it. Jesus, when he's talking to the Sadducees who denied the resurrection, he corrected them and said, you guys, are, you guys need to go back and read the Bible again. You're way off on that. And he said, God has, has referred to himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Jesus said that, Everybody that hears that title about God ought to be able to connect the dots that, that he is the God of the living. He speaks of these men not as, yep, they're dead and gone forever. No, they're alive in the presence of God because they're believers. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are healthier than they've ever been when they were on this side of eternity. They're alive. Jesus said, you guys should have realized that. And all the Old Testament saints, the true believers in the Old Testament, would have realized that. Let's go just quickly to Hebrews 11, and let's, let's demonstrate that point loud and clear. Because guess what? Job and Abraham were alive around the same time. And did Abraham, did Abraham have any hope of the resurrection? He did. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11:8. 11, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So, so they had that, but... That's not all they had. They had faith that looked beyond that. Verse 10, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Do you know we read about that city earlier today in Revelation 21? That's the city he was looking forward to. And, and we'll prove that in a moment even more. Let's read on. Verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful, God, who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, uh, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises 
But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What does that imply? If they were strangers and pilgrims here, they're going to be settlers somewhere else. Somewhere else. For they that say such things declare plainly what? That they seek a country beyond this life, beyond this world. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had an opportunity to, to have returned. Just this, this is all there is, but that's not, their faith went beyond that. And here it is right here, verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is unheavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Did the Old Testament saints know about the resurrection? Did they know about it? Now, do we have more light in the New Testament? Are, are some of these things more felt, fully developed in the canon of Scripture in the New Testament? Oh, oh, yeah, we have, we have more light in the New Testament. But don't think for a minute that the Old Testament saints didn't understand the resurrection. They did. Amen, they did. They have the same God who is the resurrection. Amen. Go back to Psalm 88. So then, what's going on here with Heman? Because he doesn't mention it, right? He doesn't mention the resurrection. Uh, we've established the fact that he, he would not have been ignorant of the resurrection, but he is doing this. He is speaking of the finality of death on this side of eternity. And he's speaking of it in this way. You know, he says things like, you know, can, can we declare your loving kindness when we go through the doorway of death the same way we're doing it now? Can we uh, declare your faithfulness when we're in the grave the same way we're doing it now? The point is, physical death brings an end to our ability to witness for God this side of eternity the way we do it. We'll still witness for Him and bear testimony and give glory to Him for all eternity on the other side of death, that doorway. But we have a unique opportunity, a limited opportunity now to be a witness for Him to the people around us, to point others to Christ. That, those opportunities will terminate with death in the way that we have them now. Right. And that's all He's saying. He's not saying, yep, that's it, just this life and nothing else. It's not what He's saying. He just wants more time to serve God and uh, the grave will put an end to that. So he's, he's praying in this manner because he's looking at it that way. And, and that's an accurate description of death. It is a significant change. All right, moving on. Let's talk about that persevering prayer. Because remember, you read through this and you say, wow, this is really a deep valley. Yep, but remember, in that deep valley, he's praying. And so verse 13, but unto thee have I cried, O Lord, in the morning... Uh, shall my prayer prevent thee? It's like it, it'll, it'll come right before you all that you, in the morning, my, my prayer is going to be right there. This is persevering prayer. And Jesus encouraged us to do just that, Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Uh, the Greek in, the, in this passage um, represents doing something continually, like not, not stopping doing it. So ask, or in other words, in the Greek, keep on asking. Ask, keep on asking, knock, keep on knocking, seek, keep on seeking. Ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Just don't stop. Yeah. Amen, just don't stop. That doesn't mean God's going to answer your prayer exactly what you're asking for every time. No, because just like children, we don't always know to ask for the right thing. And, and they might ask for something that they really think that they need, and really, it's, we know it's just a want anyway, but they're asking for that earnestly, and we have to say no, and they won't understand why we're saying no when we deal with children that way. And it's the same way when we ask, children of God, we ask certain things, and God says no, or He says wait. We don't understand it, but it is an answer, and it is the answer that we need. Yeah. Seeing then that we have, this is Hebrews 4, the end of it, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands and he cares, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, persevering prayer, unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Amen. This is persevering prayer. And then finally, we talked about another characteristic of this psalm is uh, trial of faith. You see a trial of faith in this psalm very clearly. And so the, the closing passage that we have left to read here, verses 14 through 18, we're going to consider how does this portion of the psalm reveal the, the full extent of Heman's suffering. I mean, it was panoramic. It was, if you, if you, how, how do you want to measure it? Do you want to measure it by time, 
A long time of suffering. Do you want to measure it by cardinal directions? He was compassed about by these things, surrounded. How do you want to measure it? Physically, mentally, emotionally? It's all here. And so we'll see that it's all here. And wow, it was significant. And, and we don't want to minimize it on any level. But um, we're going to be able to look away unto Jesus in the, even in that valley. And here's, here's how we're going to end today with this question. How do we know that he did not remain in this valley forever? This is how he ended the psalm, in darkness, right? How do we know that he didn't remain under that cloud forever? How do we know that? Let's read on. Verse 14. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. So how do we see the full extent of his suffering? Well, Heman's suffering was lengthy, right? I mean, it was from his youth up, whatever this was. Some people think that Heman may have had leprosy. It's possible. I don't know that that's the case, but whatever, whatever it was, it wasn't just a kind of a one-time event. He, dealed, he dealt with this for a long time. It was lengthy. Heman's suffering was definitely physical on some level. He said he was afflicted and ready to die. Heman's suffering was also mental. I am distracted. Emotional. His suffering was emotional. Um, I suffer thy terrors. And we can say it this way. His suffering was overwhelming. They compassed me about everywhere I look, all around me. And for as long as I can remember, I've been dealing with this. You know, whatever this is or these things are. He may have ended the psalm with the word darkness, but we know that he's not in darkness now. In fact, we know that Heman, right now today, is able to say a hearty amen to the first two verses of Psalm 89. I told you I was going to sneak into Psalm 89, so let's do that. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. How do we know that? How do we know that this is his perspective today? Because he's gone on to be with the Lord. And if we go back to verse 1, right? I think I mentioned this here. Uh, when you look at verse 1, O Lord God of my salvation, you see, he's not going to leave any of us in darkness. Any of us. I hope, I hope on this side of eternity, Heman got the encouragement that he, that he really needed. Uh, but I know on the other side of eternity, I know now with the Lord, he has that encouragement. And that's certainly an understatement. Uh, this is a valley psalm. So when you and I are in a valley, we have two options. Remember the rose and the thorn earlier? We have two options in the valley. We can look down at our feet and focus on how low we really are. We need to be aware of that. But that doesn't need to be our focus. Right. Look down at our feet and be aware of how, how low we really are. Or we can look up to Jesus and see how high he really is. Right. Amen. And I tell you, Heman had no place to look but up. And I know he was glad that he did. And you and I will be glad when we look up as well, because looking down at our feet, uh, that's not the perspective we need at all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalm 88, which tells it to us exactly how it is, but it doesn't leave us looking at ourselves. It doesn't leave us looking down, really. Uh, it really the persevering prayer and the faith that prevails through the trial and remembering that Heman is praying to God the Savior. All of these reminders help us, help us like, just like they helped him, to look up. So today, whatever it is, whatever the valley is, if there, if there are valleys here in, in hearts, and doubtless we, we all have some measure of valley time uh, that even may be going through right now, Lord, help us to be honest about that, but help us to look away unto Jesus in that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the good shepherd and you go through it with us. In your precious name we do pray. Amen. Now I take my stand in Jesus and serve the Lord today. I give my
If I only had one song that I could sing you, or a story I could tell before I leave. If I only had one message I could bring you, there's no question. Something beautiful about the cross. I could sing about the state of grace I live in. joy I have when times are tough. I could talk of all the blessings I've been given, but in the end, my life is dry. Something beautiful.
something beautiful about the cross, about the cross. Jesus, Redeemer, mighty to save, you are the love song, we'll sing forever, bowing before you, blessing your name. King of creation, all my soul praise him for he is thy health and salvation. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires there have been granted in what he
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to our services. Come on in. Come on in. We'll go ahead and get started with some announcements, and we're going to look ahead a little bit on the calendar. One thing we want to mention right off the bat is we could still use some additional drivers for our bus ministry on Wednesday. So if that's something you're interested in helping out with, please see Justin Crump or Rick May, and they can talk to you about that. So van drivers on Wednesday night to pick up the children for Wednesday night classes. The Crisis Pregnancy Center's Walk for Life. Uh, we need walkers who can raise funds and awareness for this important ministry. Check the site and see who is walking to support them. And you can see Laura uh, at the table in the hallway with any questions about this fundraiser. April 14th, the Kokensi family will be with us in the morning service. April 20th, men's breakfast and fellowship at the church. Uh, April 21st, following the morning service, there'll be a ladies' event meeting. If you've ever helped in any way for an event, or if you think you could in the future, please attend. Any ladies interested in cooking for events, decorating for events, being on cleanup crew for events, suggesting new events, and participating in making them happen, please plan to come to this meeting following the morning service. So again, that's on April 21st. April 26th, craft night for the ladies. This is the Better Together Titus II ministry. This will be at the church as well. We'll be making fabric garlands and uh, bring uh, fabric scissors if you have them. See Sabrina Barnes with questions about that. April 28th, John and Romans will be going on in place of the evening service. All right, so uh, looking at this week, tonight there'll be a church-wide fellowship back in Johnson Hall after the evening service. We'll have our normal Wednesday services. Thursday we'll have our men's meeting, 7 p.m. Friday is the Secret Sister Reveal at 6 o'clock p.m. at Sabrina's house. See Sabrina with questions on that. And then Saturday, Bible study and prayer for men, 8 to 10 in the module. Also on Saturday, the flea market fundraiser for Port Haven International Academy missions trip to Guatemala. The flea uh, market will go from 6.30 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. Space rentals are still available, and we're all also accepting spring cleaning donations, so things you want to donate to the cause, donate to the flea market, and get out of your house and into the flea market. Bring those this week for sure. There are forms on the members ledge for sign up if you want to be a vendor in the market. See uh, Jeremy or questions, or uh, <laughs> see Jeremy or Kathy with questions about that. All right, I think those are all the announcements, Pastor. Thanks, John. Let me uh, mention, so this coming Wednesday is the second uh, Wednesday of the month, and so we'll be feeding the children uh, for the Wednesday ministry, and we'll also be doing uh, John and Romans uh, in the module uh, for Wednesday evening time, so that's from uh, 7 to 8.15. And then, as John made reference, the fourth Sunday in the evening uh, uh, of this month. As a rule going forward, the fourth Sunday evening of the month, we will be meeting together in Johnson Hall and in the module, uh, putting together uh, John and Romans. We'll be doing that, Lord willing, every uh, second Wednesday and every fourth Sunday, just so you can make uh, reference to that uh, in your life. Also, we are having a men's breakfast um, it would normally be the second Saturday, which would be next Saturday, but because of the craft, no, because of the um, fundraiser that's next Saturday, it'll be the Saturday after that, which I believe is the, I don't know, what day is that? I don't have my calendar. Uh, Anybody know? 20th, 20th? Yeah, yeah, 19th, 20th, 27th, 43, I don't know, whatever. Whatever, whatever, the, whatever, that, whatever that third Saturday is, that's when we're going to be having the men's breakfast together. Um, many of you are aware that uh, Brother Kenny... Um, basically fainted on uh, Friday and uh, fell and broke his ankle in three places. He was uh, up in the, up at the edge and he said he just got dizzy and, uh, and then he fainted. Next thing he knew, people were around him saying, hey, hey, are you okay? That kind of a thing. So he's out in, uh, he's out at Obesey, which is in um, Suffolk. Room 201, if you want to go by and see him, he's probably watching online right now. Hi, Kenny. And uh, so if you want to go by and see him, he's scheduled to have surgery tomorrow. They're going to work on his ankle and then after that, he's probably going to have to go to rehab. And uh, so he celebrates his birthday this Friday. I believe it's 78 years old. So if you want to go by and see him uh, this afternoon, take a drive out there, 201, room 201. I know that would be an encouragement to him. All right, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. And then Jimmy will come and uh, lead us in our first song. Let's pray.
Father, I, thank you. Thank you for, well, again, I, I got great encouragement once again from the Sunday school hour, genuinely. Lord, I find looking together into the Psalms to be a tremendous blessing. Lord, as we look together at uh, Psalm 88 today and we realize that uh, there are times in life and it would appear for this, this saint that wrote Psalm 88, and it was a long extended time in his life of great difficulty. And yet the psalm begins with God my Savior, the Lord my Savior. Lord, we thank you that no matter what difficulties we are going through, we need to simply continue to come before you, even if it's to cry, even if crying is necessary, Lord, you invite us to come boldly to the throne of grace to talk to you about these things. Lord, I know in the message that we're getting ready to look at here this morning, we're going to look again at the truth that in a little while we won't do this anymore. There'll be no death. There'll be no agony. There'll be no pain. None of this will be a thing anymore for those of us that are in Christ. And Lord, this is not some religious idea. This is the truth. This is why you created us. You created us to have eternal fellowship with us. And Lord, we, we, we let that go. We, we chose our own way. And yet you have rescued us from ourselves in Christ. And Lord, we want to rejoice together in this. We want to ask you to be with our brothers and sisters that are going through uh, that, that time of, of, of weeping right now. Lord, we ask you to strengthen them. Above all, will you help us to see just how wonderful our Lord Jesus is in each and every one of our lives. Bless the time we're about to spend together now. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jimmy? Good morning. Our first song is going to be uh, Calvary Covers It All. Number 120 in your hymnal, if you'd like to turn there, but the words will also be on the screen. Let's all stand together as we sing. Calvary Covers It All. Far dearer than all the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. Now that Jesus alone for my sin did atone, and Calvary covers it all. Let's be seated. And now Warren is going to come up and read Deuteronomy chapter 1. 
Deuteronomy 119 is where he's going to start. I picked this little passage, and the main verse that I picked this passage for was the verse where it says, The Lord your God will go goeth before you. He shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And I feel like that in a lot of ways we can are like the Israelites and how when we are faced with a big challenge, um, like we don't know and we're scared, but that we just need to keep our faith in God and just trust that he's going to make a way for us when there is no way. So. Deuteronomy 1.19. And when we departed from Oreb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which he saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord your God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord your God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God, the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out of, out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. And they said, and they turned and went up into the mountain, and came unto the valley of Eshkel, and searched it out. And they took the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us the word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of your, the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover we have seen the sons of the Amakins there. There I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee, as man doth bear his son, in all the way that ye went, until ye came unto this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. Who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents that you should go in a cloud by day? Thanks for sharing that, Warren. Well, let's stand together again. We're going to sing Before the Throne of God Above, number 14 for those in the choir or up on here on the platform. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in peace for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name
Now we'll hear from the choir. it and sing it for you so you can learn it so uh, you can read along as we sing it once the first verse and then uh, we'll sing it together all right so get ready for me to have you stand
stand together as we sing the first verse of Oh God, My Joy. After we sing once, we'll dismiss Junior Church and then come back and sing it again. Let's sing together one more time. Oh God, my joy, you reign above.
Amen. This time I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 8, eight through 15. 8 through 15. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And now we'll have a special in song. seems gentle and blessings flood my way I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray but when the sky grows darker and courage turns to voice cries upward 
media. <clears throat> if you'd open your Bibles with me, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. So last uh, Sunday morning, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the title of the message was Risen. Originally, when, the, when I was looking at preaching um, concerning the resurrection, I titled the message Risen, and, and we'll see a little bit more why today. Uh, I have really felt led at least this Sunday. I thought it would be just this last Sunday and this Sunday, but we, we'll see. We'll see, we, you know. Um, I think I was thinking about this. I was thinking about how is it that Christians focus on having God help them live their lives here on earth instead of understanding that in Christ you have a completely new life. And really, I want us to be able to better understand what it is, that it, what it means for us and I'm, you know, I was thinking about it. I've been going over and over and over. It. I had a, I actually had um, time off, if you will, this week. Kathy and I took a couple of days off. Tomorrow, uh, we'll celebrate our 35th anniversary. And uh, because of the fact that uh, Kathy goes back to teaching, the schools off from their break uh, tomorrow. We won't be taking any time off. So we took a couple of days off together last week. And so while we were away, I just had some a lot of free time to just read and kind of go over these passages. And uh, it's funny because the more time that I had, the more I realized how much I wanted to um, express or help people to understand the significance of not living your old life in a new way, but understanding that you have a new life, that you actually, I really truthfully, you have life. You didn't actually have life before and now in Christ you actually have life and I realize what's interesting is in our minds we hear those words and we know that there's truth in it because we know enough verses in our Bible that indicate that it is true but I still think we're trying to live a different version of our old life just a better version of our old life but that's not really what we have anymore um, so John was a uh, Looking at Psalm 88, for those of you that weren't you know, here for Sunday school, John was looking at Psalm 88. And Psalm 88 is a very difficult psalm in the sense that the psalmist is going through uh, a terrible difficulty, and it's an ongoing terrible difficulty that the psalmist is going through. In fact, as he pointed out when he was teaching, the last word in the psalm, in Psalm 88, is darkness. So it starts uh, in difficulty, and it ends with the difficulty still going on. But one of the things that John did a really good job of pointing out is the psalm begins, the first words of it deal with the Lord my Savior. Basically crying out to the Lord my Savior. And he was pointing out that it's, it's very clear that the psalmist understands that even if the time here, even if all of the time here on this earth had difficulty in it, and it does, that this is not it. This is... so. And I know it's hard to understand that, I think, because it's what we know. So recently, Bobby McKinney went to be with the Lord Jesus. And we continue to have people who are friends of ours, who we love, family members of ours, and they, they, they leave. They, they die, and they leave. And yet, they all, if they're in Christ, they just went to be with Jesus. I mean, and what I mean by that is they literally are living what we're looking forward to. Yeah. Fully living what we're looking forward to. 
And so what I want to do, and I, and, I, and I recognize, I can see by the look on, on many of your faces, you're like, I'm not sure the point you're trying to make. The good news is I am sure of the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> the bad news is I'm aware of how difficult it, it is. I really want to turn your thinking away from this world. I want you to see not just what we're going to have in heaven, but what you already have now that you have a new life. And so it may take this week and next week to see this better, but I want your heart and mind to understand this. In Christ Jesus, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have life, real spiritual life. Not fleshly life, spiritual life. And everything is different now. And you know it, you feel it, you sense it. But I think God wants us to enter into it more. So in Luke chapter 24, let me begin reading in verse 45. It says, Then opened he, our Lord Jesus, the resurrected Christ is in the midst of the disciples. And it says in verse 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. I mentioned last week that if Jesus doesn't open our understanding, we won't understand. This is really important. You cannot study your Bible like any other book. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a science book or a literature book. It doesn't matter. You cannot study the Bible the same way. You must read the Bible as if it is a literally a love letter from God and you need him to open your mind so that you can understand what he's saying to you. And if you'll humble yourself and ask, he will meet you there and he will help you. And it says here, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now again, three years he walked with them and taught them the scriptures, but now the resurrected Christ is going to open their minds and help them to understand in a better way. And he said unto them, listen, it says, thus it, was, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ, Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, you can leave your ribbon here, but go back to Isaiah 53 with me. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Here's the first thing that matters about the resurrected Christ to you. Here's what matters about the resurrected Christ. Christ has done everything that you need to have done by himself. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down. This is Hebrews. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And praise God for that. But go back to Isaiah 50, that it behooved Christ to suffer and to die and then rise from the dead. Isaiah 53, you know this. I'm just going to read it. I don't know that I'll say anything. Just listen to it. Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we shall, that we shall see him and there is no beauty that we should desire him. I want to stop. I, I do have to say something here. It's remarkable to me that the light of the world came into the world and we didn't understand what we were seeing. That Messiah came and when we saw him, he was not attractive to Adam. If you understand what I'm saying. When, when Jesus came into the world, the world did not understand the value of what it was that they were looking at. It says that, he, that the light came into the world and the darkness comprehended it not. It didn't even, we, listen, we're so far, Adam, as a rule, is so far from what we should be that when we saw the light of the world, we didn't recognize it. When we saw the one who came to take away our sins, we were not attracted to him at all. It says in verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we have seen him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. Amen. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So as he's dying on the cross for us and paying for our sins, we believe that he is being stricken by God, afflicted, and literally rejected by God. And he is being rejected by God, but not for his sake, but because he has become sin. He is being rejected because of what I've done, not because of what he has done. Here's what it goes. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, praise God, we are healed. See, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken." And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When, he, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. When he shall see the travail of his soul, he shall be satisfied." By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, I want to stop. I'm just going to stop there. It matters to you and I, as it says here, thus it is written that it behooved Christ to suffer. Why is Christ? And I, and I know many of you say, I, I think I already know this, but I think we need to be reminded. Why is Christ Suffering. And, and listen, this is why. Because you messed everything up. Now we can say Adam messed everything up. That would be an accurate statement. Adam did mess everything up. But Jesus didn't just die for random people. He died for real people. See, he didn't just die because Adam messed everything up. He died because Chuck messed everything up. You can put your name in this. See, he was, he was wounded for your transgressions. It is really wonderful that you can say and say honestly, when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. Everything that's necessary for your forgiveness is finished. Amen. Now, I, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever done this, and you should at some point. Try to think about paying for all of your sins. All of your sins. Try to think about it. Try to think about the wrath of God coming on you for everything that you've ever done, have done, will do. Everything that you've ever done wrong, think about what that would feel like. Now do it for the person sitting next to you to your left and the person sitting next to you to your right. Now do it for everybody on the row, the pew that you're on. Now we'll just do it for everybody in the room that we're in right now. Just think about this. Now do it for everybody. For everybody that ever was and everybody that ever will be my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and the answer is for us but the same one that said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me says it is finished Amen. so I'm not forsaken you're not forsaken again and I know it is sounds kind of cliche but what a wonderful truth it is that he says, my God, my God, so that I can say, Abba, Father, right? The Son of God says, my God, my God, instead of me saying it, so that I can say, Abba, Father, which I would never be able to do if Jesus had not done this for us. So I want you to understand, the first thing that I want you to understand about he is risen is this truth. Now, the second thing I think that God would have us to understand about he is risen is in Romans chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. There's much to love in Romans chapter 8. 
In fact, I would say there's everything to love in Romans chapter 8. Not just in instruction, but in wonderful, wonderful, significant, powerful truth that we find in Romans chapter 8. Now, we're not going to look at Romans chapter 8. We're just going to jump all the way to verse 31. Go to verse 31 with me, if you would. Romans 8 and verse 31. So what I've written here is the risen Christ is at the right hand of God. The risen Christ is at the right hand of God. It says in verse 31, it says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I want you to let that sink in for a moment. If God, now listen, God shouldn't be on your side. He shouldn't be on my side. I have earned the wrath of God. But Jesus has put God on my side. Jesus, when he says it is finished, he has taken, instead of God being an enemy, he has made God my friend. And so here's what it says. If God be for us, who can be? So let's stop for just a moment and let me ask you this question. Is God for you? And the answer is, if you're in Christ, then God is for you. And then let me ask you this question. If this is true, if God is for you, then who cares about anything else? Really, who cares? And I mean that on a very large scale. I don't matter, I don't, it doesn't matter what it is, whatever, whatever would make you anxious, whatever would make you angry, whatever would make you upset, whatever would make you wonder, whatever would make you question, whatever it is, if God is for you, why does this bother you? Here's how it says it. It says, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that would condemn? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. And then here's what it says. Yea, rather, that is risen again. And here's what it goes on to say. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So let me stop here. And maybe we won't go any further. Maybe we'll not go any further than this. It is finished. It is finished. It behooved Christ to suffer. The Messiah had to suffer and pay for your sins and my sins. And that's done. And that's enough. But it's better than that. Because the the risen Christ ascended, sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And what is he doing there? Well, he's being worshipped by the angels. He's being adored day after day after day. And I believe this is true. But that's not what he's doing there. Here's what it says. It says, who also maketh intercession for us. Yes? Now again, are you a goofball? Right? Are you a goofball? I mean, there's much stronger words that I could use than that. I'm trying to be careful about how strong a words I use for my grandchildren's sake, okay? I don't want them quoting their grandfather with strong words. But you are. You are. Are you a failure? Now listen, listen. If you're in Christ, all your sins are forgiven. And yet when you fail, you know you failed. You feel that failure. You know something's not the way it's supposed to be. And here's the good news. Not only is it finished, but he ever liveth to make intercession for you. So from now, from now, until we go and be there with him, no matter what happens in your life, Christ will ever live to make intercession for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You can, listen, you can't fail your way out of this. And praise God for that. Because I promise you, maybe this is not true for you, if there were any way to fail my way out of the grace of God, I would fail my way out of the grace of God. But I can't. Because I'm not the author of my salvation. And I won't be the finisher of my salvation. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who hath begun a good work in us. He is the one who will perform it. He is the one who can say, if I I am for you, who will stand against you? 
Who would accuse you? What would they say? And what would they say that would be greater than the blood? What, would, what could they ever do or say? What sin could you possibly commit that would be greater than the blood of Christ? Amen. And the answer is none. None. Or, or you have an incomplete Savior, an insufficient Savior. And as John said in Sunday school, I promise you Jesus is not an insufficient Savior. He is an all-sufficient Savior. I just wanted you to see this. It says, he makes intercession for us. Verse 35, let's just keep reading. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. Is tribulation a real thing? You know, so here's the thing. I was out at the hospital yesterday visiting Kenny. So he's out, in, you know, he's out in Obese Hospital, and he broke his ankle in three places. And I said, um, I said, does your ankle hurt? And he said, yes, a lot. And I said, are they giving you medication for the pain? And he said, yes, a lot. <laughs> and I said, but it still hurts. He said, it does. It's a very consistent, dull ache. Now, he broke it in three places, right? So, you know, literally, as somebody was pointing, I think Russ and I were talking about it. I was talking about somebody. I'm, I'm going I'm to credit Russ for it. He and I were talking about it. I don't know if he said this or not. They're taking, they had to take pieces out. I mean, he's, he shattered his ankle, right? So is he going through something real? Yes. Did Beth just lose Bobby? Yes. Does the family feel this? Yes. Is this real? Yes. Is this difficult? Yes. Does it separate us from the love of God in Christ? No, no it does not. No, it does not. Uh, you know, one of the things, um, I know I said this a long, I've said this a number of times, but there's a song and it says, and even if you do this wrong, even if you do this wrong and miss the joy I have planned, no matter what may happen, child, I'll never let go of your hand. See, you, you and I, when we go through difficult things, we may question the love of God. We shouldn't question the love of God. Listen, 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 listen. If, 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 um, if, if you question my love for you the way I question God's love for me sometimes, after a while I'd get tired of it, wouldn't you? Right? Yeah. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, you could just keep failing upwards, but you don't have to. See, he didn't just, he isn't just risen to ever live to make intercession for you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Now, here's a truth that requires more time than we have this morning to fully convey. So I'm just going to say it. And then I'm going to try to help you understand it a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll look up here with me for just a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's a truth that said that's, that I'm going to paraphrase right now. But here's what it says. If this is it, if this, if this, if the, if, listen, as a new creature now on earth, born again, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit of God, as things are right now, if this is it, if this was all there was for all of eternity, then we are of all men most miserable. If you had to wake up for all of eternity daily, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow God, if you had to do this every day for all of eternity, then we are pitiful people because it would just be too much. But this isn't it. Amen. This is a moment. Yeah. I only have to, listen, I have to recognize that I still live in a sin-sick world and that my old man wants to run the show when I wake up every morning. I have to recognize that. But this is not it. This is only for a moment. This is only the truth in my life right now, and it's only for a moment. That's what it says in first. But I want you to see what it says in verse 20. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, Adam, Adam did this, right? Adam ruined everything. For since by man came death, 
by man came also, praise God, the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so, listen to this, in Christ shall all be made alive. So if you're in Christ, you are, and I know, I know it sounds so cliche, but if you're in Christ, you have been made alive. If you're in Christ, you have received the resurrection from the dead, and you have been made alive. Verse 23 says, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Now underline that. If you underline things in your Bible, underline at his coming. Because here's, I want, here's something I want you to understand about this. This is clearly saying that this is not that time. This is the, right now, this is not that time. There is a, um, how did, how did uh, Revelation, go to, Re John did it this morning, I'll go there again, it'll help you. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. And here's what it says. We'll start in verse 1. John did the same thing. It'll help you. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a grace void out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then it says this, listen to verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things... Are passed away. Yeah. This makes me breathe heavy in a wonderful way. This is this is still a future event. This is still a future event. This is a future event. Christ has gone to prepare a place for us, and this is that place. And soon, soon, he's coming to get you, either all of us together, if you're in Christ or you by yourself, right? Right? That's what happens. Many of us know people that we love, and they're gone. They went to be with the Lord Jesus. He just, come to, he just came and got them one at a time. At some point, and I believe in the near future, I, I do believe that that's true, I believe just around the corner, he's going to come, and he's going to get, capture the rest of us away, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And this is, this is our future, very soon, very, very soon. And here's what I want you to understand. It is finished. He ever liveth to make intercession for you, and he's coming soon to wipe away all your tears. That's pretty good. Now, I don't know. I'm going to stop here this morning. I don't know if you believe that or not. I don't know if you believe that or not. But I can say this. It's still true. I don't know if you believe some of the things that we just looked at and not all of them. Maybe you doubt some of them. It's okay, they're still true. Here's the good news. The Word of God is quick and powerful, all by itself. So just read your Bible. Just let the Word of God... I doesn't, you don't, I'm not asking you... You know, it's funny. I, one of the things I've come to realize is I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm just asking you to believe God. I'm just asking you to believe the God who said, for you, it is finished. I'm just asking you to believe the God that said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I am just asking you to believe the God that said, I ever live to make intercession for you. And I'm just asking you to believe the God that said, I'll wipe away all your tears. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. Now listen, there'll be no more sin. No more sin. Um, I know that this, I know that we have said this a number of times here at Tidewater. There are two things, there are two things specifically that I'm looking forward to about being in heaven. The first one is being with God, obviously. Being in the presence of God for all of eternity, that's the first one. 
But the second one, and I think this is just as important, there'll be no sin. Not your sin won't be there. It won't be there, but it won't be there. But my sin won't be there. Yes? Amen. How wonderful is that? Well, next week, we'll take a look together at the last thing that I think God wants us to understand about being risen in Christ. See, we are risen in Christ. Right. Not only will we go to heaven someday, but we have new life yeah. right now. Right. And I really believe that this is where the molar... How, let me say this. I want to say this well. I believe there's more joy for you in understanding that you are already risen in Christ than understanding that in a little while he's going to come and there'll be no more sin. I think that's true and I think that's wonderful, but I really believe if you, listen, listen, I believe that if you would enter in to your new life in Christ today, it would cause you to rejoice. Listen, it would really start causing you to say this, um, I have Jesus I don't care about anything else. Genuinely. Doesn't mean you won't go to work. Doesn't mean you won't pay your bills. Doesn't mean that you won't get in, stuck in traffic. That's not the point. What you'll say is, I have Jesus. None of this is the point anymore. None of this is the point anymore. The point is, I have Jesus, and I'm here to tell others that they too can have the same Jesus. Which, by the way, is why you're here. If you're a new creature and you're here, then you are actually here. You know, I have these, we have these little cards Take, take one or two on the way out. They're, they're, you can see them. They're in a couple different places. But basically, it's very simple. It just says faith, hope, love on the front of it. And then on the back of it says join us. I mean, it's going to get any simpler than that. The truth is this. Jesus changes everything. And you're here to tell everybody that Jesus changes everything. You're, you're not, um, one of the things that uh, I want to help you to understand is this. You're not here to get ready to go to heaven. Jesus already said it is finished. The moment you trusted Christ, you were prepared, completely prepared. Everything that needed to be done is already done. What you are here to do is to understand how great your salvation is, enter into how great your salvation is, and tell others about how great salvation actually is. That's why we're here. And as you understand that you are in Christ, risen in Christ, it will help you joyfully to be able to live that life. Stand with me if you would. Come on back this evening. The McKinney's, by the way, will be traveling. They start traveling tomorrow, heading back to Bolivia for a while. They'll be coming back. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jacob's going to give a uh, testimony tonight, share with us where he is, and then um, we'll spend some time together uh, tonight, and Justin Crump is going to open the Word of God. I think that'll be a tremendous blessing, and then we'll go back and we'll spend a couple minutes in Johnson Hall enjoying some time together. Is there anything that I need to mention before we close in prayer? Raise your hand high if, there's, if you have something I'm supposed to say. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the truths, just what we've seen today again, just what it is that you're trying to help us to understand, that you, Lord Jesus, had to suffer and die in our place, but that you are risen one so that you could sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us. Two, so that you could go and make a place for us and that you could bring us to this place, that you are the first fruit of this truth. And then lastly, Lord, as I believe we'll see together next week, that we also now are risen with you, put to death with you, risen with you, that we might walk in newness of life. Thank you, Father, for these truths. Bless us. Help us to be a help to each other in all of these things. Thank you for your honor and glory in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you tonight.